My name is Corey Tomlinson and I am the content marketing manager with NUX North America. I have the pleasure of actually introducing Gerard Ryle from the International Consortium for Investigative Journalists. Uh, welcome, Gerard. Thank you for joining us. No, thanks for having me. It's great. Um, could you do uh, just give us a, a little bit of uh, your background, your history, and in, in, uh, in the type of work that you do? Sure. Well, I'm the head of the ICIJ, which is a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. And what we do is we bring investigative journalists from around the world together, basically, to work on stories across borders. Um, I say we're a nonprofit. We work with big media organizations, pretty much the biggest media organizations in the world, but also the smallest little outlets and single person organizations from across Asia, Africa, Europe, and everywhere else. And uh, basically we exchange information and we work on stories together as a team. We, uh, we have you uh, talking about the work that was published in April of 2016 on the Panama Papers. So um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, everything that went on and, uh, and who you worked with on that? Sure. Well, this was um, uh, information that had come to one of our media partners, um, a German newspaper called Süddeutsche Zeitung. And they'd been given information from an anonymous whistleblower, someone who didn't tell them who they were, a guy called John Doe. And he had obtained about 40 years of records of a Panamanian law firm called Mossack Fonseca. And Mossack Fonseca was pretty notorious in the offshore world. Basically, it sets up accounts for rich and powerful people who like to keep secrets in offshore tax havens like, say, the British Virgin Islands. Um, this was an enormous amount of information. In the end, we had about 11 and a half million documents representing about 40 years of records of this firm. Every spreadsheet from the firm, every client file, every email, basically, for 40 years. It was a huge case of information, the biggest leak of information in history. And so we had to work out how to tackle it. So when you talk about 11 plus million documents, and I think uh, the number was over two terabytes worth of information, yeah. how did NUIX come into play with that and, and helping you work through all of the, uh, all the information? Well, the information came in, it, wasn't, it didn't come in in an ordered form. We didn't have it all set up in a nice, easy way. There were different, um, there were spreadsheets, there were image files, um, emails, as I said. And so basically we needed software that was going to digest all of this information and make it easy to read for the journalists that were going to get involved. So that's where NUIX came in. We, um, when we have big data sets like this, we always turn to NUIX initially and we digest the information using NUIX and we have the journalist begin the operation by looking at the information using the NUIX software. So when it came to working with a number of, of journalists on this, um, how was NUIX dispersed amongst that? Was, was it used globally? Was it used by, by local offices? Uh, who, who was using it? Well, initially NUIX was used um, by my organization in Washington. So we basically set it up on an air gap computer in Washington, D.C. And we invited reporters from various news organizations like the BBC and Süddeutsche Zeitung um, and other places basically to come over to Washington, have a look at the material. We do a lot of research on, on um, leaked material to make sure, I mean, basically to establish public interest because obviously when you have material like this, it's not necessarily obtained with the permission of the law firm in this case. And therefore, what you have to do as journalists, you have to prove public interest. And we do a lot of work ourselves. Our, my staff in Washington did a lot of work on this. We thought it was of public interest, but then we wanted a second and third opinion. So we started bringing in journalists from other organizations, media organizations and had them look basically at the names that we, that we had. We had names from more than 200 different countries and therefore it was important for us to bring in what we call native eyes to those names. In other words, people from those countries looking at names from their own countries and telling us whether or not this person was important or not. And from there, we, we then managed to, we asked a new ex if they wouldn't mind providing more software for the major media partner on this, which is Sudhoja Saitung. They were getting the information. It wasn't, it didn't all come in in one big, single, big hit, 11 and a half million documents arrived one day. It came in over a period of almost a year. So we got initially two million documents and then there was more. So we needed to constantly re-digest the information. So we, we got um, new X software for our German partners and a lot of the intelligence, I guess you could call it, at the beginning was all done through new X. What was your impression and, and your colleagues' impression of how the NUIC software was able to handle that amount of information? Um, I know that 
in, in terms of an e-discovery uh, event, it, it, was, it was a moderate, I, I think was, it was the way it was, the term that was used, but this is the biggest leak in, in, in so far in the history of, uh, of investigative journalism. How, how was the software able to handle it? Well, I mean, it's the, it's the biggest in many different ways. It was the biggest leak in history. It was also the biggest journalism collaboration in history. And, and, and basically what we're dealing with here is a new phenomenon where people, um, whistleblowers, are able to gather information on a scale never thought possible before. So journalists are having to turn to new forms of technology to basically understand what we're seeing and to start looking for patterns because stories are found in patterns. They're not found in individual names or in individual pieces of information. You've got to look for patterns. And that's where software comes in, like Nuix. Um, look, it's great because basically it's very fast and it's very easy to use. You know, I'm a journalist, I've been a journalist for 30 years. I'm a dinosaur, basically, and I can still use this software. And that's what we have to be able to do with Every journalist has got, some of them are fantastic at dealing with technology, some of them, like me, are not. Nuix is easy to use. When it came to using the software um, and working with Nuix uh, support and, uh, and the engineers that, that actually uh, support the software, um, how, how did that interaction play out? Well, what type of support did you receive when it came to actually working through all that data? Well, we had to digest the information, but there were lots of queries that we had along the way. For instance, there were new formats that we had come across that uh, we couldn't get to work. So we, all we had to do was phone up the New X hotline and we managed to get, you know, basically a fix for everything that we were doing. So we were, it was a constant updating, you know, as more information came in, we had to re-digest everything again, start again looking for shortcuts. What I like about Nuex is that it has a kind of a tree of information. You can follow, um, you can go basically from A to Z because it puts everything into nodal format. And in journalism, you know, you don't normally go from A to Z, you actually go from Z to A because you want to know how you got to a certain stage. So you go backwards, you go to the end and then you work your way backwards often in journalism and Nuex allows you to do that. So yeah, you know, in, in terms of, you know, as a journalism tool, it's, it's fantastic. And um, you know we're very privileged to be able to use it. When it came to working and supporting you, um, my understanding is that that Nuix, we had no uh, no visibility into the data itself. Um, did, was that a, de a deterring factor in terms of supporting the uh, the work, or it was difficult because we are journalists. We are we basically don't tell anyone what we're working on. We at no point told Nuix what we had, what we were doing. They basically it was a matter of trust. We didn't even tell Nuex what size of the data we had because we were working locally. In other words, we, were, we had air gap machines that were using Nuex um, and therefore we didn't have to tell Nuex the amount of information we had. We just said, we've got a lot of information in a lot of different formats. These are the problems we're finding. Can you please help us? And we would send individual queries. So we would isolate a small piece of information, send it to Nuex, look for the solution. The solution would come back and we would continue on that way. But it's very important for us that no one knows what we do. Everything we were doing was very, very secretive. I mean, you're okay, you're working with 400 journalists in 76 countries. You're working with 109 media organizations. But it was very important for us to have secrecy right up to the very end. And we were able to maintain that secrecy over a period of about 12 months. So again, from that point of view, the software was perfect for us because we didn't have to tell Nuix what we had, what we were doing. This is not a closed matter, obviously. There's still a lot to go. Um, mm -hmm. How do you envision the, the future uh, the future progressing for the Panama Papers story and for, for the, uh, the, the data? How long? I guess the two questions really, how long and, um, and, and how do you see it progressing? Well, we're continuing to work on the Panama Papers still. We, we, we started publishing in April, but then we managed to publish a searchable database of the basic information. Again, some of that early work we did using UX helped us identify and put things, because we then started putting things into nodes ourselves using different open source software. Um, we're continuing to work on that story, but for us it's always about the next story, the next bit of information we're going to get, the next big leak perhaps. Um, that's you know something that we think is around the corner. I mean, if you look at the pattern of journalism over the last five or seven years, you know, it started with WikiLeaks, which at the time seemed, you know, they had the State Department records. It seemed like an enormous amount of information. Um, it then went on with Snowden, which again seemed like a huge amount of information. Um, you know, we had a number of smaller, uh, well, relatively smaller by comparison, leaks ourselves that we'd worked on using Nuix 
um, offshore leaks, China leaks, Lux leaks, these all became very famous stories in their own right. But, you know, they were blown away by the Panama Papers. I mean, not, no one had ever seen anything this, this big before. But my prediction is that this is going to seem small in comparison in a couple of years' time because basically whistleblowers are able to gather information using technology and they are going to journalists. And this is a, I guess, a, a period of radical transparency that we're seeing and a changing of the way journalism is done, but also um, the way transparency is carried out. Is it a scary proposition or an exciting one as a journalist? Well, for journalism, it's, it's a golden period of, of time because you know, we find stories in patterns and we're able now to use technology to find patterns in a way that wouldn't have been possible before. So no, I think it's a, it's, as long as it's done responsibly, it's very important. We're, we're not WikiLeaks, you know. I mean, we don't just get information and then publish everything. And I'm not criticizing WikiLeaks when I say that. It's just a different way of doing it. We very much believe that journalism um, is there to be a gatekeeper for a society. It's very important. We spent a year researching these documents. We didn't just get documents and publish a story based on the documents. We went outside the documents. We put context around what we were seeing when we found politicians' names. And we found about 140 of them, including 12 current and former world leaders in the documents. We went outside the documents to put context around what we were seeing. We didn't just accept that this indicated wrongdoing or it indicated something. We went to court records, we went to pecuniary interest registers, we went to the people themselves, asked them questions before we published. Jared, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today and, uh, and for the partnership with Nuix. I appreciate it. No worries. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks for your help. Thanks. Yep. Thanks.